Our first panel of the conference is a conversation between Dr. Nadine Caslow, Michelle Wu, and Evan Langinger. Michelle is a third year general psychiatry resident at Los Angeles County and the University of Southern California. Evan is a third year law student at USC Gould School of Law. Dr. Nadine Caslow is president of the American Psychological Association, professor, vice chair, and chief psychologist at the Emory Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And Dr. Caslow has been a dear friend to Ellen and me for the past 30 years. So we are especially delighted to have here with us this morning. So at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Caslow, Evan, and Michelle to come up. I'm really honored and um, it's quite a pleasure to be here. Um, I have known Ellen and Steve a very long time and talking about courage, Ellen, you are you know, really a model for that. But more importantly, I think you're a model for resilience and strength. And I had the good fortune to have dinner last night with Ellen and Steve and Michelle and Evan and you two are really models for both courage and resilience. And it's um, really a special treat to have the opportunity to do this today. So what we talked about is that each of them are gonna tell their story just briefly and then we're gonna engage in a conversation about surviving, not only surviving, but thriving with mental illness and being very successful young professionals. So Michelle, would you like to start us off? Sure, so I am Michelle Wu. I'm a, currently a third year psychiatry resident over here at USC. Um, I went to undergrad and medical school at Northwestern in Ch Triberia now, Chicago. Um, I was born in Arizona, to, and my parents were both in grad school at the time. So I spent a lot of time in Taiwan with my grandparents. My grandfather is actually one of the very first psychiatrists who did therapy in Taiwan. And so he was kind of my inspiration and my hero, basically, throughout, throughout my childhood. During my first year of medical school, Granted, medical school is very, very difficult, um, but during my first year of medical school, he also became very ill. He um, had metastatic colon cancer. So I started to have glimpses of depression kind of throughout first year. Um, during my second year, he passed away, and at that point, you know, I, I definitely started to spiral out of com spiral into my depression because at that point, I felt like I didn't have any advocates or support from my family, like anyone who would really understand me um, during my second year of medical school, I stopped showering. I was really gross. Um, I would go to class, but it was almost like I was a shell of myself. I wasn't really there. I wouldn't take notes. Um, I would kind of just listen to the audio play over and over again. Nothing was really getting into my head. <coughs> there were point like, I would take the bus to school public transportation, and I would frequently see, you know, cars coming by, or I would see car accidents, I'd be like, I wish I was in it. You know, I wish that had happened to me. There was one point where I distinctly remember sitting at an intersection, and the bus was there, and there was a giant car that just kind of ran the red light. And I was like, oh, if our bus was only a little bit closer, it would have T-boned me right there, and I would be done. This misery would be over. Um, that day, I went home. And, you know, I was just really sad about it all. Um, I started failing my classes, and I actually failed out of my second year of medical school. Now, throughout this, I was taking tests and failing them, right? Um, but the administration, or the deans of the school, they would send me these really stern letters. I mean, like, what's wrong with you? You know, you're not performing to the best of your abilities. And my parents, when I would tell them about this, too, they would. Um, they would basically say the Asian equivalent of, you know, just pull yourself up or get over it or, you know, the Asian phrase is add oil. So it would be add oil to the fire, you can do it, you can get out of it, right? Just snap out of it, right? Now people who have depression understand that it's very hard to just snap out of it, right? Um, my mom would tell me, you know, just ask for extra credit, you'll do fine, you know, that's all you need. Um, clearly that was not possible in grad school. Um, so I kind of, I, I saw a primary care doctor, 
because they told me to go see a doctor. They didn't tell me who to go see, so I went to go see my primary care doctor. My primary care doctor heard that I had headaches, so she put me on Tylenol, right? She heard that I was having trouble breathing, so she gave me an asthma inhaler. Um, she knew I couldn't sleep, so she gave me Ambien, right? She knew that I was having anxiety, so she gave me Propanolol to slow down my heart rate. Um, she knew that I was just feeling tense about things, so she gave me Clonopin. I was perfectly healthy. I was 23, 24 years old, and I was on five different medications, right? And I think part of it was my fault, right? Because I didn't want to come out and just say, like, I think I'm depressed. I need to go see someone. I just gave her all my symptoms, and she never actually asked me, like, are you feeling depressed? Do you feel like you're going to kill yourself, right? Because if you had asked me that question, I would have very honestly told you, yeah, right? Um, this actually continued on for a little bit, for quite a bit, quite a long time. Um, and it wasn't actually until later on in medical school, third to fourth year, that I finally saw, started seeing a counselor. And that was only because I came home and I just kind of offhand told my roommate, and I was just like, oh, you wanna hear something funny? Today I thought about, you know, how wonderful it would be if I was just dead, right? And then I laughed and said, oh, but most medical students probably think that. And she looked at me and she said, no, because I'm a medical student and I don't feel that way, you know, and this is not normal, Michelle. And she actually forced walked me to the student counseling center that day. And I know that if she hadn't done that, I would not be here today. Thank you very much. Evan Langinger. Uh, can you hear me? Is my mic working? Uh, and uh, I'm a third year law student. I was, um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2007. So that would be the, the sophomore year of um, my undergraduate education at, at UC Berkeley. Um, before I get there, I was uh, born and raised in, in Los Angeles. I went to public high schools in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and then, you know, I had good grades. I was a good student, really excited, and I started at Berkeley. Um, really off on, on the right foot. Um, but uh, sort of in the second semester of my sophomore year, um, I went through uh, one of the bigger stressors in my life. It was a, um, the end of a romantic relationship. And it sort of had ended in really you know, scary terms for me. It turned out that the, um, the woman I had been with was a, an intravenous drug user, and, and it, she had gone back and started using, and I just you know, had never experienced something like that before. It was really jarring. Um, and so I immediately ended the relationship and entered into a, into a depressive phase. And, and it was just marked. I, I kind of had insight about it. I knew that something had changed in me. I wasn't excited to go to like my Shakespeare class anymore. And I wasn't, I wasn't um, eating as much and I was sleeping a lot more. And so what I did over spring break was um, go and see my primary care physician who put me on an antidepressant after just hearing my symptoms really quickly and said, you know what, I think Lexapro is going to help. Um, and what it did is it did start making me feel a lot better, um, almost pretty much immediately. Um, and, and what it, I think it did is it triggered a manic phase. And so I, I shot up um, completely and I, I'm having the best time of my life. I'm no longer you know, sad and depressed. I felt like I had gotten over things and I had zero insight about what was going on. And it sort of just snowballed from there. I finished the semester. You know, I got a C plus in that Shakespeare class, but I was still kind of like okay with that. But you know, that was completely abnormal for my academic progression at that point. Um, I entered into a summer school in a Spanish class, and I started not wearing shoes. Stopped with the self care. Stopped, you know, showering. Um, I, w you know, I wouldn't sleep. I was exhibiting completely rapid fire thought. People would, you know not be able to really follow me and the connections that I was making and the conversations I was having. Um, and, and it sort of just got worse and worse and nobody really was around to, you know, people were saying, oh, Evan's changed, you know, something's different. Maybe, maybe he's just, you know, discovered what it means to be like a Berkeley hippie. And I was living in like a, a cooperative housing situation at the time. And so I really think a lot of, a lot of my manic symptoms was being misread as um, a, a student who's finally, you know, experimenting and learning more about the world when it really it, it wasn't it wasn't that way and even people close to me would talk about how you know man Evan sure you seem like you have mood swings now and I said well I, I didn't even know really what that meant I didn't know how to respond to sort of reports about my behavior um, things got progressively worse as I began my junior year um, and I entered into uh, a psychotic phase and I was um, features of that were uh, strong beliefs that I was other people, that 
what people were were just reflections of my own personality. That was a really, um, and, and I believed it, just like I believe right now that you know I'm sitting in this room where you guys believe that you're in the town gown. Um, it's, it's really, it's almost really fascinating to, to encounter false beliefs. It's something I've never forgotten and it's stuck with me for the rest of my life because you, you sort of learn how fragile your mind is um, and, and how easy it is to slip away from being with you know, other people in terms of your ability to reason and, and appreciate sort of this consensus reality that we can share. I was, I was out of that. I was out of that for a good three months. Um, at the time, I'm enrolled in all these philosophy classes, so I'm reading Kant, and that's just really messing with me, and so a lot of my psychosis <laughs> is focusing on you know, Heidegger being in the world, and I'm, and I'm misunderstanding what these concepts are, and I'm, I'm um, uh, you know, someone will say, you know, why don't you turn on the television? And what I start to understand by a simple phrase like that is, oh yeah, because television is something that comes on to you, and like you enter into, and it, it's, you know, you're absolutely psychotic. It's, I can talk about more about what it's like to be psychotic if, you, if you're interested. Um, but it, eventually, uh, another woman that I had, you know, somehow started a, a romantic relationship with and was dating, realized that something was wrong with me. And she's 19, I'm, you know, 20, maybe. Um, and she convinces me finally to go back to Los Angeles and to receive treatment. And she kind of just tricks me. She says, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you were in LA right now? And I said, yeah, it would be. And I, you know, went and bought a plane ticket that night for that evening um, and flew back to Los Angeles. And I just showed up um, from a taxi at my parents' house. And I said, I'm here. And they're like, shouldn't you be in school? You know, what's, what, why are you here? You were just here for Thanksgiving break. And they hadn't noticed anything strange about my behavior when they sort of encountered me, even though, you know, I was telling them I have to write this paper and I stayed up, you know, for two days to write it. They thought, oh, well, you know, college students, they really work hard at, at what's going on. Um, it was when I went home that second time that I sort of had this, this violent episode. I got into an altercation with my sister, who was in high school at the time. Um, and I think she just said something like, you know, why don't you just like wear shoes when you walk outside? And I said, I don't need to do that. You don't know anything about me. And I went into my old bedroom and I kicked the door down. And it was like this violent experience. And, I, and that was just like the first moment that I, I realized that I wasn't behaving normally. I'd never acted violently before and I had just destroyed this door. And I, and I just sat down and I said, you know, I think I need to go and get help. I need, I need to see a doctor. And so I was taken to, uh, to see a psychiatrist who then um, suggested I, I stay in a psychiatric ward at Los Encinas Hospital. And I, and I was quickly 5150 there and I, and I spent 17 days um, in a psych ward. Um, then after, I, you know, I, after being medicated, I took lots of antipsychotics. Uh, was released and really quickly I, I, was, I stabilized and my family actually allowed me to move back up to Berkeley. So I, I was hospitalized maybe like mid-December, stabilized and at the beginning of February in, in about 2008, I moved back up to Berkeley and I started just living, working at the, the university library, um, working in a warehouse and it was sort of this really interesting, you know, almost like self-medication occupational therapy that I got myself into. Um, and I was able to then re-enroll in university in, in the, the summer term there and finish sort of, sort of on time. Um, that's, that's my general story, but we can Thank you. go over here. You, if you each look back on it, what was the lowest point for you? What was sort of the worst moment or worst thing that happened? thought of wanting to kill myself. I remember. So those and it really just came out of nowhere. It wasn't like I got a bad grade and then I was like, now I want to like, you know, have a bus run me over. It was just, you know, I would be walking to the grocery store and it would just be these overwhelming thoughts would just overwhelm my head and be like, if this happened, it would be great. And then I also felt guilt because I was like, why don't you just do it? Right? And, but I was too much of a wuss to actually hurt myself. So I would think of these elaborate ways for other people to help me die. And I think that was definitely my lowest point. Were they sort of obsessive thoughts? Or would they just sort of come and then they they'd come. go? Yeah, they would come and go. They would just sort of come and go. Mm -hmm. Did you have a sense of what triggered them? Not really. Like I said, it would just come out of nowhere. I would just, I mean, I would ruminate on the fact that I thought I was you know, this imperfect Asian daughter now. You know, I would think about the fact that I was not living up to my potential per my pa parents, you know. I got into this great medical school and I was squandering my education almost. 
Mm -hmm. What about for you when you think about sort of the worst? Yeah, well, I remember when I was in it, um, the lowest point was when I was hospitalized and, and I, you know, I was in the ward that was not locked down initially and then um, I entered into another girl's room uh, in the middle of the night because, and I was just, I have no memory of this and I had been, um, I was taking a significant amount of, of uh, medication, it was probably my second day there. Um, and, and after that, after I sort of violated someone else's space, they put me in the lockdown ward and I had to spend two days just in a room that was locked. So it was like my first sort of experience with um, being confined and not able to, to leave. Um, that, was, that was a really low point and I felt really scared at that point and out of control and I felt like I had, I had made a mistake about wanting to go to the hospital at that moment and, 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 um, and had deep regrets. And after that, I would, I would call my parents, I would call my sister, I would, you know, I'd call my girlfriend and say, I wanna get out, you know, get me out of here. Um, but, but looking back, the lowest point really was before I was hospitalized, and that was when I was really psychotic at the end of November, um, and I had started to, to criminally offend. I would, you know, the worst thing that I did was uh, this guy slided me, so later on the night I went back to his car and I took a rock and threw it, she was through his Jeep's windshield, because he had just, you know, angered, and I just thought that was a, a reasonable thing to do, and I'm just not sleeping. So that was really the lowest point for me, I think, if I hadn't gotten help at that moment, I wouldn't have been here. I would have picked up maybe uh, a criminal conviction. I, I wouldn't have been able to go back into school easily. It would have really changed my life. So I, I dodged a, a bullet there, absolutely. Sounds like you each dodged bullets. Yeah. You mentioned going to being put in seclusion for a couple of days. Can you share a little bit about what it was like to be in seclusion? It, you know, my memories of it are foggy. I just remember the room was small, was painted like this weird uh, salmon. Um, you, could, you could look outside the window and see other people that were like in seclusion in other rooms. Um, they would, that's where I had to spend the majority of my time. They would let me out for, you know, cigarette breaks, which was really weird. So part of, you know, I, I started smoking in confinement. That was a, a weird thing that I sort of picked up. Um, <coughs> I just, I just remember, you know, just, you just want the, you know, you just want the door to open. You want to be able to go into that common space and then maybe outside. So when you're sort of locked down, you're just, all you're thinking about is like just a little bit more room to get out and you're, and I mean, the boredom is, is intense as well. So it's, it's really awful. You're all, you're, you're just waiting for even someone to walk by so you can make your argument again as to why you should be released, how you know you didn't know about going into anyone's room and you know, you're really sorry, but they don't, I mean, they, their protocols have kicked in and they're not gonna listen to you, but you still feel like you can um, convince them. And these are the, the wardens or the guards. Uh, yeah, just lots of waiting, terrible boredom. And then making me feel like it had been a horrible idea for me to choose treatment. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what it did. What, what do you think, there, each of you sort of talked about a person that kind of helped you out, that really was there for you. Can you talk a little bit about the people that have really made a difference to you? Sure, um, well, definitely my roommate, I think, was a big key person for me. I'm, I think I'm very glad that I went home that day, actually, and I told my roommate what I was thinking, because I think normally I probably would have gone to the library where everyone's stuck in the continue thinking what I was thinking and probably would have hurt myself in some way if I had gone, if, you know, if that had happened that way. Um, my family, strangely enough, has become very, very supportive. I mean, like, like I said in the beginning, at first they were kind of just like, pull yourself up, you can do it, um, ask for extra credit, it's, it'll be fine. Um, and it was really hard talking to them actually during medical school because I felt like they didn't understand. So we actually had what I call like a figurative shaking kind of conversation where I was just like, please, like, you know, this isn't something that I can just um, get over, you know, this is something I need your help with, you know, and I need you to recognize that I have these symptoms and I need you to understand what the symptoms are so that way, you know, you can help me in the future. And, you know, at that point my mom just started crying. I think she knew what I was going on this whole time, but she didn't want to admit it to herself. And so since then my mom has been very good and she, Every time she talks to me on the phone, she's like, are you eating? Are you showering? OK, good. <laughs> um, 
you know, the people who the people who are really important to me are the people who can um, recognize when I'm decompensating and when I'm entering a manic phase. And so, um, when I started law school, I uh, was off medication and off treatment, and I had done that sort of. I wanted to see if uh, I could do that, and I did it on the advice of a psychiatrist. Um, and, and really quickly, when I started law school, I realized I needed to go back uh, onto medication, onto lithium again, and onto um, regular therapy. Um, but, but I would share the fact that I had bipolar disorder and train a, a, with close friends, and particularly the, the person that I've lived with for the last year and a half, my roommate Leslie. I, you know, I would let her know what the symptoms were, what to do if she sees me speeding up when I talk, or if, she know, if I ever tell her, hey, you know, I only got like two hours of sleep last night, or I stopped eating. Uh, those, are, those are my signs. And so you start with one person, and then you can sort of share with other people, and that becomes sort of a safety net and a, and a community for me. Um, other people that have been really supportive and important in my life, uh, of course, are my, is my family. Um, you know, they, they weren't weirded out when I said I wanted to go and see like a psychiatrist initially. They were saying, yeah, we were even thinking about maybe doing that. And so and it was a weird conversation, them learning about what uh, my mental illness was, myself learning. But they've been supportive each step of the way. Luckily, they had, you know, private insurance. I was able to go to that Lost and Seen as Hospital, which is, um, you know, I might not have been able to afford to go to if it was a no insurance or different situation. That has been a big help for me and has helped me. Uh, progress and succeed. Um, I mean, a, a really important person in my life is my father because he has severe uh, depression and anxiety disorder and he just finished a round of, of ECT last month. That, so I've been going home every weekend and we've been coping with the side effects and the memory loss of that. So it's really become sort of, my family has been sort of this um, rock where now it's mutually supportive and um, always keeping me vigilant and keeping me aware of you know, my own potential for um, uh, going off the rails again. Families is definitely essential um, in, my, in my success story so far. <laughs> you know, so it seems like social support is kind of one thing that's been helpful to each of you in terms of doing well and coping effectively. What are the other things that you think have made the difference for you that have enabled you to function as well as you do? Um, sorry, could you ask that question again? Yeah, what are the other things besides social support that have enabled you to be so successful? I mean, besides social support, it's, it's definitely regular medication. Um, and, and more than regular medication is the talk therapy. So I go once a week. Um, uh, I, I recently got on the USC plan, and I guess I have 25 sessions that I can do paid for a copay. And if I didn't have that every week, if I couldn't go and unload all the stress that I have with clients in the immigration clinic that I'm working with or just talk about school, um, I, I don't think I'd be able to get through weeks. And I would really probably quickly become non-compliant with, with my program. Um, I, I think that treatment aspect is, is the most important thing beyond family support and beyond um, uh, the people that I know that I've sort of reached out to and created a network to assist myself. So for me, I think definitely social support is probably the most important thing. And then the other really important thing is just self-care, you know, making sure that there's dedicated time to really, you know, go to therapy and make sure you take care of yourself. Um, for some odd reason, I don't know, doctors find it really hard to go see other doctors, I guess. But I have, I have not been on medication since my intern year, and I'm currently a third year in residency. And it's hard, you know, and I think I would probably be, I, I, I was just having this conversation with another friend the other day, and I was kind of like, why am I making it so hard for myself? You know, it, could, it would probably be so much easier if I just went back on medications, you know, if I started therapy again. But it's hard, you know, and I, I know that that's something I probably should be doing, you know. So I appreciate your honesty with that, and I guess I'm wondering what are the kinds of things that people could do to help you with that? Because you're not alone in that sense of it's hard. Um, you're more the norm. And so how, how can we help you? So we do have a program in place at our, in my psychiatry residency program where you are allowed to have two hours of therapy every week, 
Okay, that has to include you know getting there and back and the forty-five to an hour that you're supposed to have with your therapist, right? So most people choose to have it at the beginning or the end of the day. Now there is also kind of this thing where some residents will go to therapy at 3 p.m. on Friday, but they don't really go to therapy, you know? And because of that, it's almost seen as if, you go, if you're doing the therapy thing, you're basically just leaving work early. You know, you're not really necessarily getting help that you want or you need. And so I think that has really deterred me from seeking out that t therapy thing because I'm, I'm perceived as one of the good residents right now. You know, I'm perceived as someone who can handle everything, and I don't want anyone to start thinking the opposite. So it's very much the whole stigma thing, right, that we're talking about here. Um, but also I don't want to be seen as, like, you know, a lazy resident who needs to have two hours of therapy every single week. I mean, two hours of therapy, that's two and a half patients that you can be seeing. So I think if there is some way that we could just kind of force that into our program, you know, where every single resident is seeing therapy for educational reasons or otherwise, you know, I think that would help normalize it for everyone. And the cost would hopefully be helped with too. So I'm, I'm wondering how somebody like you could, could shift your courage from sharing with us to courage to advocate mm -hmm. for this and what would make that difficult to do? What's difficult is that, I mean, the stigma is so huge, right? I mean, um, to be perfectly honest, before the September SACS program, no one in my residency knew that I had this huge depressive, huge depression and anxiety and issues. And only a few people actually still in my residency know about it now. Um, because as you can see here, they're, they're, if you're a doctor, you know, raise your hand. Okay, so maybe like just a handful of people are actually here, right? So I actually felt very safe when I came to, my, to the September program that even though I was outing myself, I wasn't really coming out. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna tiptoe out a little bit and see how it goes. Um, that said, I mean, there were a couple co-residents who saw the program online and did approach me and, you know, they tended to be the ones who were also were having problems, so they felt like it was very useful I do realize that my microphone is going in and out, so I'm sorry, guys. Um, also, um, the yeah, is there something we can do to kind of help with that? You, you want, it's just because I'm turning my head, so if I just look at you guys, sorry. Oh, you can, <laughs> here, <laughs> yeah. Um, what was I saying? You were talking about only a few residents. Yeah, so only a few residents knew, but it was online, and then. In the past six months, I've suddenly become this person that people text message on our pagers if they have personal emergency crises. So I'll get pages and I'll be like, hey, can you call my cell phone? I'm going through, I need a little bit of psychiatry, personal psychiatry help, right? Um, so even though I'm sure people still don't know what I actually look like in person, uh, they know where my, how to get my pager number and how to get that stuff. I don't know how I got onto that tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, I think you're talking. I don't think that was a tangent. I think you were talking about stigma, and how hard it is, even being in a psychiatry department, mm -hmm. for you to feel like it's safe to go get help. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel. I have to admit, I feel kind of protective of you. Like I want to call up your residency training director and say, "Now look, this is kosher. This is legitimate. She's not going to the beach." <laughs> You know, and by the way, you ought to think about this for the rest of your residents. Mm -hmm. You know how to how to think about think about that so that it's a comfortable, safe thing to do, mm -hmm. um, because stigma is unfortunately still so alive and so well. Yeah, I mean, it's still alive and well in the law school as well. And and since I, uh, you know, did the fall program at the Saxon Institute, and even before that, when I would just you know, tell people why I was going to work in the mental health court for my first summer job, I would, you know, follow it up with, oh, it's because I have bipolar disorder. And I think some people knew, and after they know, they do come to you, and they'll just kind of, like, privately share their stories. They've had coffee breaks with people, and then, you know, at the end of it, they'll be like, and please tell no no one. I don't want anyone to know. I just want you to know, Evan. And so, I'm, you know, it puts me in a weird position because I have no training to really 
uh, give them any support other than I think treatment has worked for me in the past. Maybe you can try that. Do it. Um, it's it, it is interesting. I feel like you know it's kind of sad that that is is what our institution is going to force. Um, people to do when they want help is go to the guy who's just sort of like out and can't really provide you any assistance. Um, yeah, I mean, things that I would want to change, if we could just talk about that, at least at the law school, I would love it if, and we, we talked about this, at, let me back up, so we have a really strong clinical program um, at USC, and, and I'm in the immigration clinic, and there's a you know, the post-conviction justice project, and all of this work is dealing with clients who have really significant problems in bad criminal pasts and you know abuse and rapes and it and when you are working with these people it starts to really affect you and it really affects me I'm hypersensitive to these things um, like I said just dealing it becomes the biggest part of my therapy sessions every week dealing with with my work so I wish that at least for those students or students who are starting to really in, interact directly with clients or do maybe um, other kinds of work in the community, there could be counselors or, or at least, you know, a couple days each semester where counselors were just coming and you could take advantage of that if you wanted or not. And it could be anonymous or it couldn't be. Something like that I think would be, you know, really beneficial to the students. And, it, and you know, you see it in the law school where there's a lot of people already self-medicating. I mean, we have the, you know, every Thursday, the bar review, and you see people starting to already slip into substance abuse um, as a way of dealing with the immense pressures of a rapid-fire three-year program where you want to get the job and, uh, and be successful going forward. And, and that, I think, is sort of accepted by a lot of, you know, I, think, I know the administration is aware of it. They don't really like the fact that some of these public interest trips become parties, but I think that, that the reason it's happening is because of a really high stress level, at least for the, all of the students. And then maybe even some people who are start or dealing with mental illness um, in sort of in the shadows. And so if we if we could just one nip it in the bud with counseling initially, I think that would would go a long way. And two, just make it more okay to avoid to sort of be out and ask for help. I don't really know how to do that. So, so that's, those are two really wonderful suggestions because one thing you're talking about is sort of having the counselors essentially come there and normalizing what I think you're talking about to some extent, which is vicarious traumatization yeah. or yeah. secondary traumatization, yeah. taking, on. taking on the trauma of people you're helping who have trauma stories. So there's already a significant portion of our student body dealing with that um, and, and then, you know, just expect to go and get help for it on your own, figure it out. Um, I think... You know, I think if we recognize that early and made, even making treatment part of sort of the curriculum would be a good step. So then they know when they leave law school and they're feeling stressed out about, you know, a client that they have 10 years from now, the thing to do in that situation is to go and get therapy or is to go talk to someone. Um, I think it would be really good to start off our students on the right foot with, with that because it's been enormously helpful for me. Well, the other thing that I, I wonder was sort of implied in the comment you made earlier was that you have, quote, 25 sessions. Yeah. And I found myself wanting to pay for your other 27 sessions. Um, and because I say to myself, you're saying this is really helpful to you. You're like a walking advertisement for psychotherapy. Yeah, sure. And, um, and combined with medication, obviously, for, for your condition. Um, but we don't have that option available. And so... I would assume another part is, is advocacy related to the parity issues mm -hmm. so that you can have 52 sessions. Or more, I mean, a, or, enough such that you can right, go weekly whatever you for need. the undergraduate term. I mean, that, right. I just got on USC's health insurance when I got off of my parents, which was much better. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was it. That's the limit, 25, and then you pay out of pocket for the sessions. You know, before that, I had to get screened. Um, so before I could see a psychiatrist, through uh, the USC Aetna plan. I had to talk to a USC uh, counselor. They had to sort of like give me a referral that then I then printed out and had signed and gave to my current psychiatrist. So that was, you know, another week and a half delay before I started seeing treatment when I really wanted to. Um, luckily, I didn't, you know, spiral out of control in that delay, but some people could, you know. Absolutely. Uh, a small interruption like that's all you need. Sure. What kind of suggestions do you have, Michelle? Kind of based off of what Evan was saying as well, you know, he was saying if we could just build into the curriculum, that would be great. 
Um, but even if it's not built into the curriculum, can we get psychiatry and psychology out of the basements of departments? I feel like that would be so helpful because at Northwestern, you know, our counseling center was in basically a, a ghost building and it was still in the basement for some strange reason, even though there was no other offices or building or departments in there. And so it's kind of like if you went into that department, if you went into that office, which is this drab, gray, falling to pieces building, you know, if you went into that building, people knew that it was because you had a mental illness and that you were getting help or that you were getting treatment or whatever. Um, there's actually one time I, the library's like located just adjacent and I saw someone coming out of the library and I was about to go to a therapy session and I actually saw that person, I was like, they're going to know why I'm like, I didn't have any of my books with me, so there's no way I was going to the library, right? And I was like, they're going to know that I'm going to this other terrible place called psychology or counseling, right? And so I actually ducked behind hedges, like bushes, so that way they wouldn't see me. Um, so they wouldn't know I was going to this building. So, you know, even if we could just somehow normalize counseling so that's just with other departments, so that if you're going into the building, you know, it's not that obvious or, Maybe that's, maybe that's part of the stigma. Maybe it's okay if we go into the building. But you know what I mean? It was just, it was, that was one extra barrier, one extra boundary that prevented me from getting help earlier, I think. Sort of where it was located mm -hmm. and how obvious it would be you were getting help. Yeah, to, to get a reasonable accommodation for your exams and at the law school, you have to go into the student uh, office and pull out this bright orange paper that you fill out, you know, it's the only one that's colored there. It's like, you're basically saying, you know, give me time and a half on my tests. And that, that's a huge stigma uh, in law schools. And I think that's because, you know, the exams are so important for the curriculum. And the minute you sort of are going to be putting yourself in that room where you're going to get twice as much time or a little bit more time than other people, the resentment just immediately kicks in. Um, and, you know, I've never gotten an accommodation for, uh, for my exams. Um, and, you know, part of that is because I felt like I haven't needed to, but a big part of that is because I didn't want to throw myself into the conversation that a lot of my peers have about those people who go and get uh, disability accommodations and um, who, are, who are cheating and shouldn't therefore have the grades that they do and the success that they, the success that, that they subsequently get, you know, in the job market or whatever. Um, I don't know what to do you, about that. You told yeah. an, a really interesting story last night about that with somebody who was sitting in front of you. Oh, yeah. Can, are you comfortable sharing that story? Yeah, that was, that was right before my constitutional law exam. We have our laptop up, and you know, you're, you're in a small class, and you've been with these people for a month and a half, and you really you know, get to love them in a weird way um, okay. going through the ringer. And, and you see you know, someone missing. So the guy in front of me comments, like, you know, so-and-so is missing, looks like, you know, he was able to like lie about the fact of having ADD and has accommodation. He's gonna go and get time and half. He's gonna destroy this exam. Because really, like a little bit more time on these exams um, can, can really be beneficial to, I think, the, the average student. Um, so I said, you know, uh, maybe I just floated the idea. Maybe he needs it. Maybe he's not malingering. Um, and then I said, you know, I have bipolar disorder and I, I take a lot of medication, but I just don't, you know, feel like I need to have that. I think my treatment, um, it, I finally just figured it out, it's working for me. Um, and he was like, well, yeah, and that's because you, know, you have dignity. And then, and I, and I, I just like, didn't respond. And then he shared the fact that he has depression and is on meds as well, and he could go and get uh, an accommodation if he wanted. And so I just thought that was just so sad that, that you know, both of us aren't even recognizing that, that this would be a really beneficial tool, that it's a bigger struggle for us to just do the reading, do a time pressure kind of exam, type it all out. Um, and instead, we're going to, you know, sort of tear each other down, tear out, down this other guy. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I, I tried to share, and I, that was the experience, and I just began my exam sort of with that floating in my head. Um, did you do okay? Uh, yeah, I did fine. Come on, was a great, I had a great <laughs> professor, so that's why. That's good. You know, each of you chose to come out, and I'm wondering how you made that decision and how that's gone for you. I went into psychiatry because I, I knew I had this, you know, and I wanted, I felt like it would help me be more empathetic towards my patients, it would help me understand them better, you know. Um, and then I never thought about actually coming out, like, you know, frequently I will have patients who are like, oh, you don't know what I'm going through, and I kind of want to be like, yeah, I do, but, you know, that would cross too many boundaries or whatever, so I never do, but that's actually why I went into psychiatry. I wasn't very, I didn't know 
that I would come out, actually, to be perfectly honest. I, I kind of wanted to package it up and leave it in my med school past and never have to think about it again, especially since I am doing okay now. You know, I'm not currently on meds. I still have days where it's really hard, but you know, I'm doing okay. So there is a long, there's a big part of me that just wanted to keep this all kind of tucked under the covers, you know, kept in my closet, so to speak. Um, but then Dr. Sachs, you know, really, she invited me to do this program and I was just like, this is, this is what we need to do to help fight the stigma, you know? We need to have conversations about this and about the fact that psychiatry and mental illness is so prevalent, actually, in the general population. It's just that thing that we don't talk about, you know? So I wanted to help kickstart that conversation and I wanted to be part of that, so that's why. And, and how has that gone for you? It's, it's surprisingly okay. Um, that said, I'm going into child psychiatry and you know, kids are a lot better at technology and they, I will be much, easy, much easierly Googled by them, I think, than my current county patients. But I think it's okay. I think it, hopefully they will understand that, it's, that I have this experience so I hope to use it to help them more. So how do you think it'll be when the adolescent who's mad at you comes in and says, well, you know, you have depression or you're a crazy doctor or whatever mm -hmm. lovely adolescents can say exactly. to their therapist when they're mad at them? How do you, how do you imagine handling that? I, I don't know. I imagine I would say something like, oh, which one did you, like, which article did you read or something <laughs> like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that it would start a conversation so we can talk about how you know, medications and therapy have been very helpful for me, and that, that's what I hope would happen for them, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you? How's it been for you to come out? Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I still don't share it with, like, a lot of people, you know, with most people. Like, sometimes I'll, you know, people ask me, so what are you doing this week? And be like, oh, you know, talking on a panel, just people even at law school, you know? Um, or, I, or I'll say, you know, I, I didn't even really let anyone know that I was going to be doing this today. I didn't popularize it. I mean, it's posted all over the school, so it's hard to miss. But, you know, that, I think that says a lot. That's, that's where I was. Even though I've already spoken uh, in an event last fall about um, uh, having bipolar disorder. So, ostensibly, everyone in the school knows. Um, it's, I, started, I started coming out uh, and, and talking about it in response to sort of... Uh, you know, job interview questions. People would be like, so why do you want to uh, work at mental health advocacy services? Oh, and instead of kind of being like, well, it's been in the family, I just kind of took a jump one day and I said, well, because I have bipolar disorder and it really means a lot to me. Um, and then, you know, I started working at, at, at MHAS and, and then I would sort of come out to clients and say, yeah, I understand what you're talking about when you're talking about the tremors with uh, lithium and it's hard for you to sign documents because I'm on it too and I, I feel you. So it really helps me in my practice, which is you know, mental health advocacy and criminal defense, indigent criminal defense, where, where it's coming up a lot. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I, I, don't, I don't have much else so to say. So there's probably a lot of people in the room who have not come out. I know there's some people who have come out, but I bet there's more people in the room who have not come out. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands. What advice would you have for people about coming out? You don't have to do it in such a public forum. Um, and I think, you know, just coming out to one person, you'll real, someone, one person that you really trust, you know, that can actually be really helpful for for you, because as Evan and I have both mentioned, you know, it was just that one person that really helped us, you know. Um, it's that one person that kind of keeps us on the rails, right? So it doesn't have to be in front of hundreds of strangers, you know. It can just be to one person that you really trust and know will, you know, take care of you too. Yeah, I think, I think I'd also want to emphasize the, the therapeutic value of coming out, which, you know, at least for me, the more I, it helps me maintain insight, you know, and the more I can talk about it and the more people know, um, it, it's almost like a guarantee on my safety, you know. And so I think, I think 
that's really been true of me. And so if you're thinking about coming out, I think that's you know, an unexpected benefit that, that you can uh, expect. Um, <coughs> yeah, I would, I would, you know, there's still people out there who are going to you know, call you crazy or you know, it, that stigma is really out there. So I would, I would be careful. Uh, I, I think it's a risk and I think it doesn't really affect me, the kinds of work that I want to do. Um, I think it's going to, it really helps me, and it helps me work with my clients, and I think that's unique. But I think you know, for some people, it really might, uh, it might be a, a problem for you professionally, and, I, and, and I've seen that just, just from conversations I still have with people, and I'm always paying attention to people's views on mental illness, and it's always something I'm writing down, and as you guys are, probably are as well. Um, and so, yeah, the stigma is really out there. So be, yeah, still be careful. But, uh, it's gratifying and there's a community to support you when you do come out. My, my program directors, when they found out that I was doing this, or attendees in my, in my program realized I was doing this, I was interviewing for child fellowship programs. And at that point they were like, hey, be careful who you tell this to. You know, like this could really be professional suicide. And I'm still here because I think that there is such a value in coming out because we are, we are trying to fight the stigma, right? And I think if there's that label like you're crazy if you have something, if you're on meds or anything like that, or you have depression or you have bipolar or you have schizophrenia, right? That automatically throws you under the crazy label. And I think if more people can come out, they can realize that we are not just the person that you read about on the news. You know, that we're normal working people in the community, actually. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The person in the news is this violent yeah. person who, you know, deserves to be killed by the police or something, you know? And mm -hmm. that's really, I think, what people believe. Well, one of the things that we've had conversation about is the issue of um, uh, licensure um, at the state level and the questions that get asked uh, around mental health um, issues and challenges. And as we know, in some states, it says, you know, do you have any mental illness problems? Um, and if you say yes, then you have to go through a whole rigmarole to, to get licensed. Um, and so people are left with either lying or telling the truth and knowing there's sort of a whole set of challenges that come forward. And states really vary on the questions that are asked for credentialing as well as hospital level credentialing and whatever. What do you two think are the fairest questions, if any, to be asked on those credentialing forms or those state licensure forms. Yes, some states say, do you, do you have a mental illness? illness? Yeah. Or are you currently receiving treatment for a mental illness? Some yeah. states say. But I, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair question, you know. Is the, it a, the, if, the one that California is it affecting, does it affect your capacity to do the yeah. work? Presently, yeah. What about for you? I think for the Medical Board of California, the question was something along the lines of, and it's been a while, so again, I might not get the wording exactly correct, but it just asks if you have a physical disability that would um, affect the way you treat patients, right? And so when they're asking about something physical, and they're also asking about just disability that would affect the way you treat patients. So it doesn't ask about like whether or not you're on medications or need therapy or anything like that. It's kind of just looking at whether or not you're going to be able to treat patients the same way you would be able to treat anyone. Anyone else would be able to treat patients. So I think it's fair. Okay, so it sounds like you think it's okay for something to be asked, but the focus ought to be on capacity to, to do the job, not just on whether or not. Whether or not you have it, yeah, or whether you're disposed to, you know, decompensate in the future, mm -hmm. you know. It should be about now. Because mm -hmm. um, then, you know, it's just, it's empowering. So then, you know, I will give my clients to other people and stop my practice if I become too sick to serve them, you know. And I, I like being in control of that decision and that having that autonomy is very important to me. Right. And I, I would want my professional licensing board to sort of respect me in that way. Sure. You know? So one of the things is I know there's a number of counseling center directors here. And I'm wondering what advice you all have for counseling center directors, for people who you know, run counseling centers that are available to students on campus. God, I, I don't know. I've never really made use of them, um, so I don't. I don't feel like I have a, a lot of advice. Um, you know, I, I appreciate you guys pushing your message and going to students so that they don't have to go to you. I think that's really important. Um, I, you know, it, it's 
I know that they're there on campus, and, and that is, is a safety net in and of itself. So I think letting people know that you're there is really important. But com coming to students. Coming, coming to students, as yeah. opposed And to repeatedly coming to students, and just making that a part of the, the persistent mission, I think, is important. Um, I, I, don't, I don't. I agree with that. You know, it's hard for students to come to you for some strange reason, you know. Um, so I agree that. I think if you can make, you could come to the students somehow. I don't know how we would do that per se. Maybe we could have like wellness fairs where you just, or you require that everyone has a mental health checkup, you know, like an annual physical. You have an annual therapy session to make sure, you know. Yeah, that's what I think it should be. It should yeah. be built into our curriculum yeah. that you have to sort of uh, learn how to get therapy um, for your profession. And if the student centers can play a role in that and inserting, you know, creating that class or inserting themselves mm -hmm. into the curriculum and all the schools, I think that would be really helpful. Because um, whether you think you need therapy or not, I think you can benefit just from self-reflecting and talking to someone. Okay. And then you might discover, actually, this is great. Uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more about that. Yeah. One of the things, you know, uh, Steve mentioned earlier that diversity was really an important part of this conference. And you brought up sort of your background as being, you know, both parents being from Taiwan and your Taiwanese background. And you said a little bit about your culture and how that plays out. And I'm wondering if you could each talk about cultural factors that you think may play a role in all of this. Well, I think, um, and this is just me, I'm not trying to speak for the entire Asian community. <laughs> Um, but I think for me, you know, I was definitely raised in this very traditional Asian family where, you know, I was expected to do 100% on all my tests. You know, I was expected to get straight A's, if not straight A pluses, you know. Um, so when I started not doing well in medical school, my parents didn't think that was necessarily like me being depressed. And this is, I mean, I was a stellar student all the way up until then, okay. So all of a sudden they didn't think, you know, it was because I was having mental issues or that I was depressed or I was anxious or anything like that. And it was just, you need to ask for more extra credit. And actually the funny thing was, I, I think I, the very first conversation I had with my mom, I was like, oh, I'm really not doing well. I think I need to see someone. You know, I think I need to see a psychiatrist like grandpa. And she actually, that was when she told me, you know, oh, you don't need that, just go get some extra credit. You know, so, um, I don't know, I guess for, for Asian communities and for Asian families, you know, when you know that your student, when your child who has done well so far academically and suddenly isn't, it's not necessarily that they're just poor students all of a sudden. I think we really need to dig deeper and find out what else is going on in those schools. Yeah, and I, I grew up um, uh, in a multiracial family. So my mom is Mexican and my dad is Portuguese and Polish. And so we just, I, I didn't really have like a, a strong Mexican identity or a strong identity uh, with, you know, my Portuguese side of the family. And so that was always just personally a, a question. I didn't know where I fit. You know, I got kicked out of Mecha in high school because they're just kids. It, it, was, it was sort of became uh, a feature that I focused on in my manic phase and, and and, I, and identity has always sort of been a, a, a big question for me. So I think, um, I think maybe for multiracial students, you're going to see sort of uh, issues about who they are and where they belong um, coming up as sort of the content of whatever mental illness they may have. And so just, I guess, to be more aware of that. But I, I, don't, I haven't thought much about the way race or my culture sort of uh, how it affected um, my mental health situation, but that's one thought. There's, there's other aspects, of course, of diversity, like, for example, gender. Do you have a sense of gender playing a role in this for either one of you? Well, I mean, I think definitely uh, I was safer by virtue of being a man and going through a completely psychotic episode. You know, I, I just, you know, I could walk outside um, and not uh, get jumped or harmed in the middle of the night going around, you know, Oakland, where I would take, take buses to. You know, so just, just I, think, I think that's the most obvious reason I was safer um, during my treatment, which also meant I kind of delayed in getting treatment. Maybe if I had gotten you know, hurt or something, I could have gotten treatment faster. So that it's, it's complicated, but, but at least being male has, has made my journey probably easier, I would think. 
so funny because I was just thinking that if I were male, I think it would have made my journey harder <laughs> because, uh, you know, especially in the Asian communities, right? The guys are supposed to be like this strong, stoic kind of person. So I wonder if I had been a guy, I don't know if I would have sought out help. Even if my friend had like forced me into there, I probably would have walked to the counseling center and then walked right back home. But I don't know. Yeah, now that you say that, yeah, I think there was a little bit of like when people were, like my good friend sort of identified that I might have mental health issues, but unfortunately started studying abroad um, the semester where I really uh, fell off the wheels. Um, and I kind of was insulted by him telling me what to do. And I was like, hey man, you know, I'm my own person. And I think that was a very male response. Um, and didn't, I didn't want to be told what to do. Uh, I didn't want to be told to go see someone. Uh, lo and behold, like, you know, I got tricked into it later. But I think, yeah, I think, I think gender roles really played a significant part there in being treatment resistant. Well, we certainly know that males are much less likely to seek services than I didn't know females. That. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, males are less likely to seek services <laughs> than females, so there, there's definitely sort of a, a gender difference, pretty much a, across um, racial ethnic groups. What about sexual orientation? Is that a factor for either one of you that you can see? Um, I'm, I'm straight, so I, I don't, I mean, it hasn't played a big role in, in in my uh, development and in my illness. I'm straight as well. Um, yeah, so it hasn't made, played a big role. I'm wondering, though, if, yeah, no, actually, I can't think of anything. It was weird answering that question, I know. too. I felt like I was, you know, outing myself as a straight person, you know? <laughs> yeah, really, it was, uh, it's tough to talk about yourself. Well, it's, that is interesting comment, actually. That's just sharing various parts of ourselves. Because when, you know, when I right, because when I think of diversity, there's so many elements of diversity. It's sort of easy to start with the racial ethnic part because you each have sort of an interesting background in that regard. But there's so many more elements to that in my mind. So, so is it okay? I outed your sexual orientation. Yes. <laughs> I did let them know ahead of time that they were free to not answer any question oh, that, that's that, right. that yeah. they didn't. <laughs> oh, you forgot about that? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm just commenting on the experience. It's the experience. Yeah. It's, it's, no, that's very interesting. I know that Steve had mentioned that there was an opportunity for people to write down questions if they had any. And if I, it looks like there are a couple of questions um, and so if people want to bring those forward, and we'll see in the, the little time left, oh, there's a lot of questions. If you just want to bring them up, Stephen. Um, obviously, we're, we're, not, um, we're not able to get to all of these. Um, well, there's a whole bunch of questions about being on a, an inpatient unit. Oh, really? Um, there, it looks like there's a number of, of questions about being on an inpatient unit. Um, the issue of seclusion, um, the issue of what an ideal unit would look like. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit. Um, one of the questions even ab about the seclusion question has to do with, um, with the issue of patient rights and the potential abuse of seclusion as punishment rather than treatment. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the seclusion experience a little more and being on a mental health unit? Well, I'll, I'll be clear. It was, it was only for two days that I was in that uh, lockdown ward. Um, it wasn't any, any longer than that, and then I was let out. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, now that you mention it, did, it did feel like a punishment to to have to go there. Um, I thought it was interesting you called them wardens. Huh? I thought it was mm -hmm. interesting that you called them wardens. That might just be my language now that I think <laughs> I'm in jails all the time with clients. <laughs> but um, I mean, when you're in a psychiatric ward, there's a big difference. When you see your doctor, it's like it's the best time because they listen to you and they care about you and you feel like you're gonna actually gonna make progress on your treatment. Um, but when you're with uh, the rest of the staff, and like I guess I'm gonna use words that maybe aren't right, but the orderlies and the nurses in the nurse unit, um, there, there's definitely uh, uh, a 
feeling of disrespect there and that you're just, you know, what they have to deal with day in, day out. And they, and they have really challenging jobs and I'm not trying to mind them anyway. But that, that, um, that's always really sort of the worst when you have to go to the window and get your meds um, and maybe, you know, you think that there's like uh, a different one you should be taking that you just sort of learned about and it's not there and you get worried and they're just completely unsympathetic. That is a dehumanizing experience. Um, also, I, I found when I was in that psych ward, you know, a lot of the orderlies, they just start, you know, they'll just whisper in your ear, just snap out of it, just, you know, you can, you, you seem like a good guy, you said you were going to Berkeley, like, why don't you just, like, you know, move on from this? And so, you know, you're thinking, you're like, are they, they don't even understand what a mental illness is. Mm -hmm. And so, that's sort of the world that I was in when I was getting uh, treatment at the hospital. And it makes you regret wanting to, like I said before, it makes you regret wanting to go in for treatment there. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know who asked that question, but I don't feel like I'm answering it. So, so, rights. I don't think people should be, anyway. Go on, no, you don't no, think no, people no. should, okay. You know, I've worked on an inpatient unit my entire career since actually I was a freshman in college and was one of those mental health technicians. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about seclusion, and I'll just, I'll just make a few comments um, related to this, which is that I think that there's a time and a place for seclusion, but that it's extremely rare and infrequent. And I think it gets way, way overused, typically because people want to manage the unit as opposed to do what's best for the patient, in my opinion. I think we we're talking about when we asked each of them what was the thing that helped them most, they said social support. When you're in seclusion, there is no social support. And essentially, you're left alone with your emotions and your thoughts, which may be very disorganized and difficult. And so there's actually some programs that have a very humane approach, which is that they put you in a room to get you away from this excessive stimulation, because sometimes when people are psychotic, the stimulation is difficult for them, but some, they're not strapped down and somebody kind and caring sits with them and is available for conversation with them. And so they get the reduction of the stimulation without the isolation, without the sense of punishment, but rather let's try to help reduce the stimulation. So I think there are very humane things that we can do um, rather than you know, you go into somebody's room, okay, well, you shouldn't go in their room, there needs to be a response, but two days of seclusion probably is not gonna be the most helpful response. Yeah. And, and it wasn't pure seclusion, you know, I got to go out for, you know, to a smoke. couple hours. <laughs> to smoke. But when, mm -hmm. during those, you know, outside smoke breaks, you know, I wasn't allowed to talk to certain people and, and you know, I could talk to just these two, you know, mm -hmm. for a second, and then you, you know, you're forced back in. So any, the minute you start talking to someone else, they separate you, so they really, they, they are keeping you more secluded, even during the social hour, during the, the social break. Right. So it's, it's weird. So, um, so there's obviously lots of other questions here. Um, one of the questions I'm gonna ask you, because you brought this up, has to do with the issue of self-medication. Mm -hmm. And if you could talk a little bit about how you think self-medication affects people's ability to get help. Self-medication, I think, leads you into this false belief that you're getting help, but you're not really, right? Um, so during my intern year, I it was around a bunch of anniversaries and I was studying for my licensing exam. And so I actually went back on Zoloft, but I prescribed it for myself because I was like, I know exactly what dose I'm supposed to be on, so forth and so on. Um, I think it did help, but I didn't think it helped in the way it didn't help 100%, you know what I mean? I think if I had started seeing a psychiatrist and actually got started on the medications appropriately um, or through kosher measures, you know, and I think they would have also suggested that I do this therapy. And I think I would have probably been in therapy since my intern year. And now I wouldn't have be dealing with this whole, am I a malingering resident if I take this two hours? Are there any positive aspects you can share about your experience with mental illness? I think the biggest positive aspect is it's sort of, it's shaped my work and sort of given me a, a calling, you know? And I didn't, I was looking for that and now I've found a way to be of service to people that's intensely meaningful. And I, and I like being with other people who have gone through similar experiences. I think that's the most positive thing. And I think that's another benefit of, you know, sort of being open and out is you can, um, 
work with, with people and you can do kinds of work um, without having to live this sort of like double life and be in, in, in secret about it. So that's, that's the best for me. I completely agree with that. Definitely you know, has shaped what I do now. And since coming out, I mean, it has the added benefit of other people come to us now, you know, and they tell us these things and we can help them also. So. Okay. Um, okay. Um, do you think that there were other people who tried to reach out to help you before you reached your sort of breaking point? And if, if there were, do you think there are things they could have done differently? Um, and what could they have done differently? Well, I was just talking about that friend who went abroad. I mean, what he could have done differently, and I think you would agree, uh, Michelle, is, is walk me to a psych ward. You know, take me to see a doctor then. So I think if you see warning signs in someone and they, you think they really need help, uh, it's, it's not just telling them. It's sometimes, you know, taking them to the next step and then see if they can receive treatment. Uh, then I have weird feelings about, you know, forcing someone to receive treatment and civilly committing people for, you know, weeks on end, which sort of like, at the end of, I was, you know, 51, 50, and then I wasn't able to leave the hospital for 14 additional days, and I really wanted to get out at that point. But what people could do is sort of be a little firmer in their suggestion um, at the same time as saying, you know, it's okay, it's not, I'm different. You're obviously going through something. Uh, I was actually thinking that there were a lot of my meds, fellow med students who, you know, you were walking to class and you kind of see them. And I think there are a couple of them who actually asked, like, how are you doing? Not in that colloquial, like, oh, how's it going kind of way, but actually, like, how are you doing, right? But because we were walking to class, it was so casual, I, was just, I would just kind of brush it off and I was like, oh, that's fine, or stressed out, but, you know, typical stuff. So I think if you are worried about someone, you know, have a private conversation with them, you know, and actually sit them down. And then if they are having a lot of issues, help them figure out the next step, you know, help them go to the counseling center if that's necessary. Yeah. It'd be nice if, you know, a question would be just, so how's your uh, mental health today? Yeah. You know, and just ask, so how's, uh, how's that pressured speech going? <laughs> feeling it? Yeah. I, I mean, if someone asked me that, I'd probably be like, yeah, I'm not feeling it, and that'd be the end of the conversation. But I think that's really interesting in the way we talk about colds, you know? So I think if it gets there, that would be really Yeah, just kind of like how my mom asked me, you know? Shower today? Okay, good. Yeah. That's so let me ask each of you how your mental health is today. Well, I've been going through some stress with my father and you know, transitioning through school and all that. So um, you know, I've ramped up my meds and I'm seeing my psychiatrist a, a little longer. So now we're doing an hour and 15 minute sessions where before it was you know, every other week we had sort of gotten into that routine. So I feel stable, but in a phase where I know I need to take care of myself a little bit more and so I'm vigilant. So. And how did the stress of doing this today affect you? I was definitely nervous, you know, last night, as Steve knows, Stephen knows, um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I was worried I was going to get up here and talk a mile a minute, and maybe I am, and I'm just not aware. No, uh, I, I no, worried, you're not. It, it, you know, it definitely made me feel like I might go off the rails, or I, maybe one thing that, that's, like, I've all, that's always stuck with me after experiencing psychosis and after speaking with people and having them not understand what I was saying. So I, you know, I'm trying to reason with them and they just are saying you're speaking nonsense, is I've always been, since then, really skeptical of whether I'm making sense in public or to people. It's like a constant worry that I have and that I think about all the time. Well, whether, you've made incredibly wonderful sense. That's good, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad. And it's good to hear that. What about you, how's your mental health? My mental health? Um, so I was just going to say, it's a good thing we both stay away from the coffee today, right? So. No, I have a little bit of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my mental health is okay right now. I definitely think that I need to go in for a little bit of tweaking. Um, because I'm nowhere near as bad as I used to be um, in medical school. I'm not having suicidal thoughts or anything like that. But it's definitely gotten to the point in the past couple of months where I'm like, I can start to feel it coming back, you know? And, when my mom asked me that question, I know we've joked about it a bunch, you know, did you shower today? There's been a couple, there's been quite a few days where I've been like, no, I didn't feel like it, right? So I, I'm starting to feel that I probably need to go back. So it just reinforces the idea that, you know, mental health and mental health wellness is not just, you know, something that you get over. It's not like the flu, right? You can't just get over it. And I think it's something that you need to take care of your entire life. 
Well, I, I know we have to wrap up, but I guess um, I want to say that I think you two as underestimated why you're doing as well as you're doing. I think you two didn't take enough credit. You are both incredibly thoughtful, uh, interpersonally gifted, self-reflective, uh, dedicated, hardworking, impressive human beings. And you have tremendous strength that you bring to these tables. And your courage and your openness is refreshing. And it has been truly an honor to talk with both of you. And doing so has improved my mental health today. Thank you very much. take a half an hour break before we begin our next session.